Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Robin Minter Smyers, a partner at Thompson Hine and president of the City Club's Board of Directors. I'm also a proud member of the City Club. I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, the director of the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections, Gary C. Moore. Over the past four years, we've featured many distinguished speakers who've addressed issues of race, class, mental illness, justice, and injustice as it pertains to who we incarcerate and why. The varied voices we've heard from have included author Brian Stevenson, the founder of The Marshall Project, Neil Barsky, Girls for Change CEO, Angela Patton, and exoneree, Jarrett Adams. Today, we add a local voice to this list of speakers. As the topic of criminal justice reform dominates the local and national news, we're honored to welcome Gary C. Moore, Director of the Ohio Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. This is a special opportunity to hear Director Moore's perspectives on incarceration, criminal justice reform, and reentry. Our speaker today was appointed Director of the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Correction by Governor John Kasich in January 2011. Director Moore has more than 44 years of correctional experience and a national reputation for being an innovative prison reformer. Since beginning his career in 1974 as a teacher's aide at Marion Correctional Institution, Director Moore has been a progressive figure in the world of corrections. Director Moore, who's the president-elect of the American Correctional Association, was awarded the very first Tom Clements Award for Innovation in Correctional Practices in 2016, and also the 2017 Career Achievement Award by the Association of State Correctional Administrators. Under his leadership, the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Correction received the Lucy Webb Hayes Award, established to recognize correctional agencies that have achieved 100% compliance with both ACA accreditation standards and the Prison Rape Elimination Act standards. Director Moore is a member of the Vera Institute's Advisory Council of the Safe Alternatives to Segregation. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming today's speaker, Gary Moore, the Director of the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections. Well, I, I usually start my, my communications, and I will today, by saying it's a great day to be alive, because it is. We have a tendency to forget about that sometimes, don't we? But in that song by Travis Tritt, and I'm not a Travis Tritt, uh, I don't know a lot about him, but in the third line of that song it says, there's hard times in the neighborhoods, and how true that is, and how difficult that is for us to navigate as we start talking about criminal justice reform. You know, I, I get emotional when I walked into the, to the lobby and I saw the pictures on the wall of those that have presented. Um, awesome is not a big enough word. In fact, I, I shared my thoughts that I looked at the, the picture of Robert Kennedy. Robert Kennedy was the most important person in my life that I never met. He came to me at a very difficult time of my life and gave me a sense of hope because he gave hope to others. You know, and it's awesome, I, did, I was the lowest paid person in the, in the entire state uh, agency at $2.64 an hour as a teacher's aide. And just the sense of being here and looking at this group is, is uh, it's unbelievable. 
I'm pleased to have a, a lot of great staff there. I appreciate the great staff that are here, and quite frankly, they stood with me in 2011 when we changed the mission of our agency from a page and a half of incapacitation to simply say that our mission is to reduce recidivism among those that we touch. That didn't go over real well at the beginning, but they stood with me. And let me just say this. You've got a great group of judges in this community and criminal justice practitioners. I can actually walk in and have walked in and, and, and met and talked with the entire uh, congregation of uh, judges without being thrown out. That doesn't happen everywhere. In fact, I'm not invited uh, to many places. And what about the Cleveland Browns? What about the Cleveland Browns? Now, I, I'm a believer, and I charted every time Jimmy Brown carried the football. These guys know the story. When I was growing up, I had a tablet in front of the TV to see how close at the end of the game I would be with his total yardage. And to speak right after Mr. Haslam, Jimmy spoke that day on April 25th was a huge honor. And as proud as I am with what I saw last week on the field, I think all of you should be much more proud of what they are stepping into and doing in terms of lifting people up. I mean, we're working right now on the, these Cleveland Browns being invested in people coming out of our prisons back into the communities to make our community safer and give the folks coming out of our prisons a sense of hope. I am proud to be affiliated with the Cleveland Browns. Lutheran Metropolitan Ministries, I, I've got to talk about that. I, you know, I brought the Attorney General up, didn't I, uh, a, a few months ago. What we are doing at that facility with cognitive-based programming, with culinary arts programming, with transitioning folks and giving our, our ladies a sense of hope, right? It's unbelievable. I can't walk out of there with a dry eye, and I cannot. It is caring about those that need to be lifted up. And we're so proud to be a partner with you in changing lives. So today's not going to be about me standing up here talking about great things we're doing. Because if the truth were known, we have much farther to go than we've already come. That's the truth. And we need groups like this to be able to help push the agenda. I'm going to give you a, a, a glimpse of what I've seen in 44 years and some of my thoughts about the future, but I want to start with why I am so committed. Mr. Haslam, why I am passionate. This is a calling of my life. I, I retired once, right? I was a prison warden 12 of my years, and I was a little crustier then probably. But I was a warden, and, and I spent a great time, and I retired at the end of 2002. And I thought my wife and I were going to start our business, more correctional insight. We may start that again. And we retired, and we did a number of things from 2002 to 2010, and we were happy. We had a place at Sunset Beach, North Carolina, that since I've been director, I have not been to very often. <laughs> and December of 2010 came. And I'm going to tell you a very personal story. And I got a call from the transition committee saying, would you be interested in being the director of the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Correction? And it was an honor. I loved my work. I loved my work. I loved the people that worked. And quite frankly, I loved those that were incarcerated. They're human beings. And I thought for a while, and I, I moved into another room so my wife of 46 years wouldn't hear everything I was saying. But I politely said no. I, I selfishly were having too good a time. A second call came in that week and said, would you reconsider from the transition committee? I was a little shorter, but I said no. A third call came in and I said no. I said, I appreciate the offer, but I'm settled. I'm moving forward. A fourth call came in that week. If you believe in divine intervention, I do. The call came, and they said, listen, we know you're no, you don't want the job, but would you at least go talk to John Kasich, because people are giving him ideas on how to run the correctional system. 
but you only have 15 minutes. Well, I did share that with London. London says, yeah, we live about an hour out of uh, Columbus. And London says, yeah, 15 minutes, we'll go and we'll have lunch. So my wife was all in. So we went on December 27th, 2010. That's about seven weeks after the election, right? The largest state agency in government seven weeks after the election. So we go up to that, and I'm going to walk just a bit. So the transition office was in the 19th floor of the Rife Center. And it's an interesting floor because at that on that floor at one end, there's a refreshment center. So I dropped Linda off there, and I said, Lynn, I know she likes diet sodas. I said, don't make it a large. We only got 15 minutes. So I dropped Linda off, and I walked to the other end of the building, right downtown Columbus in, in, in the transition office, and I meet John Kasich for the first time. I'd never met him before. He looked like he did on television. I, I, this is being broadcast, but I will say this now. His hair was kind of as screwed up as mine, you know. But, but he says, Gary, he says, John Kasich, he said, we only got 15 minutes. I said, that's the only thing I know about this meeting. We got 15 minutes. He says, so let me tell you, I'm going to tell you what the plans are for the agency, and would you just react to those? Sure, no problem. So he says, Gary, this is the deal. We got an $8 billion budget gap, and you all have read about that. Uh, in 2011, and that's true. And he said, you're the largest consumer of GRF dollars. In fact, we have 25% of all the employees of, in state government work for us, 25%. And he said, what we're going to do is we're going to close five or six prisons in Ohio, and we're going to send about 10 to 12,000 inmates out of state to the states of Oklahoma and Minnesota, and we'll lay about two to 3,000 employees off. They're going to charge us this amount to, to house the inmates, and it's costing the state this amount. We're going to save tens of millions of dollars, and that's critical. What do you think? I looked at him, and I said, that is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. I did. I wasn't going to take this job. I said, Governor, do we care about the people in our custody? Do we care about the neighborhoods that they're going home to? Because it doesn't sound like that to me. Folks, 15 minutes went to three hours. And we talked about a lot of things. We talked about him losing his mom and dad in a car accident to a drunk driver that spent about 30 days in jail, and that was it. We talked about all those things, three hours. And there was some yelling that goes on, and, and uh, it, was a, it was an emotional discussion. So at three hours up, he asked me a question. Is your wife here? I said, yeah, she's down at the end of the hall drinking sodas. <laughs> so, so he sends a suit down to bring Linda in. And as I said, Linda and I have been married 46 years. She's one of the three people that lifted me up and kept me out of prison, and I mean that. And I mean that. That is not a joke. She comes in. The governor lifts his hand up, and he says, John Kasich, Linda, we have just spent three hours in this room. I don't care whether you're the governor of Rhode Island. Three hours with the governor is unbelievable. And he says, I believe in Gary. I want him in this job and we're doing it his way. At that moment I took this job. And for eight years I've been given unconditional support to travel our own path. Now many people in the state don't like our path. I understand that. But I am steadfast believer that we're all human beings, that all of us deserve more smiles, not just those in our custody, but the families that love the people in our custody. I took the position, and for eight years we've been committed to our mission of reducing recidivism, giving people a second chance, changing lives, and saving lives. But boy, do we have so much further to go. Let me tell you what I've seen. 
July 1st, 1974, walked in, I walked into a racially segregated prison, July 1st, 1974, and three years later had the ability and the opportunity to desegregate that prison at Marion. That's an experience that I, I count on every day. There were seven prisons a day. I started 8,300 inmates, and of those 8,300 inmates, I got so excited, I apparently jumped, excuse me. Of those 8,300 inmates, there were 291 women incarcerated in the entire state of Ohio, roaming around the grounds of Marysville. Our budget, and that, this is adjusted to today's numbers, would be $230 million to operate our entire system if you took today's dollars to operate the system. And of the state employees, 5.2% of all state employees work for our agency. Look at today, 27 prisons, 49,408. We're actually down 1,800 inmates from the peak of when this administration, 1,800. It's not enough. It's not enough. Our budget is now approaching $1.8 billion. And one in four state employees works for us. Now listen, you know, that's factual, but what we don't get to, and this would be a great group to think about it, how do you as taxpayers feel about that expenditure of your dollars coming to our system after an issue and problem has already existed? I'm not sure there would be many Ohioans that say, man, this is a great idea. And yet we continue to march in that direction. That's why I need the Cleveland Browns, the, a voice. So, so who's coming to prison? Great question. Males and females, the number one reason that people are coming to our prison system, 13.1 people, their most serious offense of men was drug possession. And of women, it's almost one in four. Most serious offense is drug possession. And you can see the other offenses here. Now, what is disturbing to me is that we now, unlike 1974, we now know what works. We know how, what evidence-based programs work. And what we know and what was cited, if you want to look at the Washington State Policy uh, Institute Journal, of November 2015, it will show you that community-based programs for nonviolent human beings are twice as effective as sending someone to prison at one-third the cost. And yet we continue this. And I, I've got to tell you that, and I'm not long for this position. I know that, right? I'm not long. 44 years, my God, how much longer am I going to be? <laughs> this is what I will... I will leave and will be the most disheartening piece of information that I will leave with, and, it's going to, and I will leave with a heavy heart. We've increased funding to the communities by $103 million out of my budget to the communities to, to try to work with nonviolent folks that need a second chance and not allowed to smile, mostly drug offenders. If we look at 2015 and we take the intake study of 2015, calendar year, and we look at the number of people whose most serious offense was drug possession, and then we step over and we look at 2017, people whose most serious offense was drug possession, in the state of Ohio, we have actually increased the number and the percentage and the density of people coming to prison in 2017 whose most serious offense is drug possession compared to 2015. Are we going the right direction? I don't think so. Now listen, there are people that need to be in prison. And quite frankly, people that are selling drugs are violent offenders in my mind. They are violent offenders. Prison is the right place. But I'm not sure people that wake up in the morning and say, I'm not sure there are people that are addicted, I'm not sure, that wake up in the morning and say, thank God I'm addicted, I get to go out and get some more drugs. 
treatment works. Bringing people into prison for two or three months, and often, particularly in the women's side, that's what happens, two or three months, because of jail time credit and, and, and their sentences up, and I'm looking at these young, do- young women that look like my granddaughter. And I'm going to have them for two or th- What am I going to do for two or three months? It's time for reform. This is, we need to reform and not tinker. That's the title of, of this whole piece. So, I usually don't talk about that state up north, but I am. Ohio is an aberration in this country. And I'm the incoming president-elect of the American Correctional Association, and I see this. Let's take a look at the state up north. In 1990, we started out relatively the same, about 30,000 people incarcerated in our prisons. Ohio's the one on the right. The team up north is the blue team. 30,000 people, and you can see how this is vacillated, and we all kind of reached this peak in, you know, 2006, 2007. But the state of Michigan decided a couple of things. One, how a person spends time in prison should count. And these young ladies know it doesn't always count, does it? They went to indeterminate sentencing, earned credit for those that did a good job. Those people that hurt our staff stay longer. It motivates people to do the right thing. It's like going to class in college, right? You don't go to class in college, you don't make it. It's motivation. And they also turned discretion over to the criminal justice system, the prison system, to say, earn credit, move people into the community, make those decisions. And they said that mandatory sentencing almost exclusively is not right. In the eight years that we've been in Ohio, I've been in Ohio, we've had actually more mandatory sentences added. Two major directions in states that are bordering each other. Now, what I want to just say here, for those like me who's concerned about public safety, the rate of violent crime in the state of Michigan dropped more than the rate of violent crime in Ohio with this. Prison systems in this country are at critical risk right now. We can't even hire enough people to to, to staff our prisons. The state of Wyoming sent maximum security inmates to spend time in the state of Alabama only because they couldn't hire enough staff. You imagine the cultural change. Is there any concern about turning their lives around? But they can't hire staff. We are at a, a point where it's time to make a difference. So we're doing a few things. TCAP, boy, you bring up TCAP, and I I know I'm going to be controversial, but that's what I'm supposed to be, right? Targeted community alternatives to prison. We put a lot of money into that, about $58 million into that. Cuyahoga County is participating in that. There are 32 counties and states have chosen not to. And you can sure tell a difference in their sentencing patterns, can't you, Cynthia? I mentioned TCAP, particularly in a group of prosecutors, and I will get escorted out of the room. It's basically saying truly nonviolent, low-level Ohioans should spend their time in a community and we're going to give money to help you provide treatment. 32 counties said, we don't want your money. We're going to, we're going to send people to prison. And there's a number of things that, uh, that, that are fundamentally important to us. Specialty courts, you have great specialty courts here. Let me just suggest this, and this is kind of crazy too. I want a couple things that are off the wall, but I believe them. The huge increase, the fastest growing part of our prison population are women. I believe that we have too narrowly defined human trafficking as a legal definition. 
I believe when I walk through the reception blocks at Marysville and see the women sitting there, that women have been intimidated to do things that are criminal, that ha they have no orientation to criminality, but they in fact are bondage in the same sense of human trafficking to be able to perform those duties. I've seen it time and time again. And that they're in prison, and by the way, once someone goes to prison, there's over 800 in Ohio collateral consequences that are heaped on folks to prohibit them from living in certain places or having certain jobs. I mentioned the Cleveland Browns. Guys, I, I wish you weren't here. It'd be easier to talk about you if you weren't here. But the, the focus on Senate Bill 66, a great piece of legislation. If someone, if someone is a, a, an addicted Ohioan and they make it through and they're in a drug intervention program and they fail once or twice and the judge says, I still believe in you, historically and previously, they, they, could, they, they would not be able to have their offense taken, uh, uh, sealed. This bill allows a judge to say, no, I believe in you. I know that addiction is tough. I know there's often failures. It takes seven to ten times to quit smoking and allows that kind of effort. And, and, and let me just say that this is the cultural battle, and I'm watching the clock. This is a cultural battle that we have. The first element of this was actually recommended by a judge in Medina County. And we're making rounds. It says, Gary, why don't we have as part of sent the sentencing principles rehabilitation so that when we sentence someone, we have to consider what is the most effective tool or sentence or sanction to be able to use to turn that life around, rehabilitation. Judge Kimbler, we put it in. We wrote it, we put it in. The Cleveland Browns endorsed it. The Cleveland, I didn't even realize, Ted, you were in the room. I'm testifying, I'm going nuts like this, testifying, telling these stories. I'm talking about the Cleveland Browns, I didn't know you were in the room. But you supported that. Well, right after I was done, Supporting that plank on rehabilitation being part of the sentencing structure, the Association of Prosecutors came in and said, we oppose that. That's contrast to public safety. Now, I don't know how it is. Maybe I'm getting older and I'm, I'm not seeing the full picture. I don't see how that is. We're in a culture. This is not about X's and O's. No, no offense. It's not about X's and O's. This is about culture. This is about... Why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we placing people in prison that are truly nonviolent, that are addicted, that have their brains, their brains have been altered based on this god-awful heroin, and we're putting them into a prison setting where they're affiliating with more higher-level criminals? I don't understand. 44 years prison warden, you're right. I'm going to close with uh, this future piece here. There was a, a group of uh, media folks that had a campaign, an Our Voice Ohio campaign that went all over Ohio, all over Ohio, and listened to focus groups of people in communities talking about criminal justice. And they briefed us and they said, the first thing is addiction is a disease. And in some ways, this is, a very, this is a very confrontational issue. Is addiction a disease or is it a crime? Is it a criminal justice issue? We've got to talk about that. We've got to talk about that. We don't talk about that enough. We hear stories about someone who takes heroin one time and becomes addicted. That has happened. That is the truth. And if we believe that addiction is a health care issue, if we believe that, then how many other health care issues um, exist when someone, when, the, when they're exposed to this issue happening, are not given medication, instead sanctioned? Someone said to me a week ago, said, Gary, I find it amazing, it was a Canadian uh, researcher, said, I find it amazing that when it comes to addiction, Criminal justice requires abstinence to be able to either start a program or continue it. He said, there's no other medical condition if they exhibit something that they're not given the kind of treatment. So I, 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 I'm looking forward to the Browns talking about 
criminal justice reform. I believe we need a change in this state. I think sentencing laws need to be changed. I think the sentencing laws need to reflect how a person spends time in prison should count. If they're in evidence-based programs, it should count for something. If they hurt one of my staff, it should also count for something. They should not go out on a date that was set six years ago when we have no idea how they're going to behave. And that's what Ohio has right now. Well, let me just say this. Thank you. This is an honor of my career to be here with you today and to be able to say I affiliate with the Cleveland Browns. People that are in our criminal justice system are often discarded by society, by their families, by their friends. And the question I think that we're posed with, are they as human beings worth lifting up? At 16 and 17, I was headed to prison. I was a school truant. Lost my mom, tried to raise myself, did it pitifully. And I had three people in my life that came to my life and lifted me up. The memory and lessons of my mom that I lost, my high school baseball coach, and by the way, my mom taught me to play baseball very well, and my baseball coach shook, shook me and says, Gary, you're better than this, and drove me to the Ohio State University to enroll. And then one year later, I met my wife and was married at 19. Three people lifted me up. How many people do we see that have not had people lift them up? I've got to tell you that uh, I go to a few churches, you'd never know that I do sermons, would you? And the title of my sermon is that our worth as human beings can be found in others. All of us in this room and all of us who are not able to listen to this have the ability to lift people up, to change their lives, to, to keep the public safer. And this calling has been the greatest gift of my life. Thank you. Today we are enjoying a forum with Gary Moore, Director of the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections. We're about to begin the audience Q&A. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, or those of you joining us via our radio broadcast or live stream. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will try to work it into the program. Holding the microphones today are Membership and Customer Service Manager Corey Eisler and Youth Forum Council Chair Tio Lu or Sonia. May we please have the first question. Mr. Moore, thank you for being here and thanks for all your great work. And go Browns. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm interested in the, the area of uh, mental health counseling. Uh, and I, you know this world much better than I do, but it's my impression that a large number, large percentage of folks who find themselves in prison for whatever term and for whatever sentence have uh, some sort of mental health issue. Um, what, it just in general, are, you know, how, how do you, how do you, how's your system approach mental health counseling for those who are within the prison system and can we, can we improve that somehow? That, you're right, we have we're the largest mental health provider in Ohio. True. And I wish that weren't the case. Now we have mental health staff that provide services. They provide individual and group counseling. We have residential treatment units for those that are seriously mentally ill, where they are, their units and staff are in these units with them. Um, so we do provide those kind of services. Now, if you, if you intersect those seriously mentally ill that may also be addicted and have not committed any violent acts at all, and you take that significant portion out and put them into a community setting, I think that's a much better fit. I think what Cuyahoga County I should say Cuyahoga County from my resident up there, I guess, is the, the, the appropriate piece. But from Cleveland, 
you have specialty courts. I'm a big believer in specialty courts of judges and staff that have been trained and understand this, that call, if, whether it be drug courts or mental health courts or veterans courts, where people are brought in very regularly, ha start to develop a relationship with the judge where they're access and, and they know if they're on their medication or not on their medication. So I, I believe that the answer forward is to continue to grow specialty courts and to divert at least to start with those folks that are not uh, violent and should not be in prison. Because I, I will tell you, I would love to say that we have a totally humane prison system. That's what I would like to say. It isn't always that way. And sometimes our mental health inmates commit offenses in prison that bring them to higher security, which is even a more oppressive environment. So um, I, I believe that uh, the specialty courts to divert, I think we need more mental health beds, more residential treatment beds inside our prisons, and we need to have a mental health hospital for the most seriously mentally ill, where we have people that 24 hours that are wrapped around them to deal with. It's an area of concern. And let me just tell you, I talk about women a lot in terms of the growth. The percentage of seriously mentally ill women is almost double that of the men. It is a, it is a serious, serious, serious problem, particularly when you end up with the separation of children and, and children. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for your remarks. Every time I hear you speak, I'm inspired. Um, I do have a question. Um, some of the reforms that you referenced during your remarks um, seem like they could be addressed by an issue that's going to be on our November ballot, issue one. And I'm curious if you are familiar with issue one and what your thoughts might be on whether it's a value and if it addresses some of the things that you think would be helpful for individuals, particularly with drug possession offenses. It's a great question, and, and let me just say, I hope everyone in here does take a strong look at issue one to understand from your own perspective what that means. Now, um, there are elements in, in issue one that quite frankly follow a lot of the spirit of what we've tried to do, to divert nonviolent drug offended Ohioans, not inmates, Ohioans, into settings that are much more treatment oriented and quite frankly end up with a, a, a more significant event. So I will just tell you, I think that spirit is, is something that we have, have pushed for. Another critical element here that we had in the budget that got X'd out, if I'd had the Browns with me right before the last budget, I think we might have put this over the goal line, right? <laughs> was, was the issue of earned credit. You guys know this. If you are involved in an evidence-based program, if you get a GED or high school diploma, you go through a vocational school, there is a significant reduction of violence and a significant chance of coming back to recidivism. So why wouldn't we incentivize that? That was in the budget until the last hour, and it was passed for the truly nonviolent, the people that typically probably shouldn't be in our prison system. 61% of our population now is not eligible for that. That was stricken from our proposal, and I believe that needs to go back in. I think there has to be some accountability. Now, on the other side of the horn, too, I see cases where other inmates and staff are hurt in prison, and sometimes they do not get prosecuted. I do not feel good about releasing people that are involved in violence and gang activity in prison just because a date on the calendar turns. So I do think there needs to say, I mean, I'm getting off the point here, but but I do think there needs to be major reform. I, let, let me say this. I think this is a legislative function. I think it should have been handled legislatively. If I see a path forward legislatively, I'll endorse it. I haven't seen one yet. So um, I think it will have an impact on the, the drug offenders coming into prison. Uh, and I think that um, there will be an increase, because it requires us, as we're doing now, to take savings and put back into the community and, and, and if anyone has ever heard anything I've said since 2011, January 4th at midnight, 2011, it is that we need to be taking our money from our prisons and reducing it. And let me just tell you, I've got to tell you this. I, I'm sorry, I've got to tell you this. So the, one of the hardest things that I had to do as director of this agency was last year, because our prison population, we are funded at a, we are funded at a level 1,900 below 
where we are. I'm a full prison. I'm operating a full prison above what our budget indicates, and I've got to be within budget. And it was based on all of our reforms. Well, our reforms got distorted. So I had to take $26.5 million out of my community correctional line, out of Cynthia Mauser's line, and put it back in the prison line that managed our prisons. I was sickened by that. So take a look. Nonviolent Ohioans are handled much better in the community, and I, I urge all of you to, to become familiar with that and, and make a choice uh, with that. Uh, thank you. We'll take a Twitter que question next. You spoke of the challenge you've had getting prosecutors and some judges on board with your vision. How is that connected to the fact that we elect judges and prosecutors in our communities? Well, I think there's a natural opposition. I, I'm an old warden, right? I would be upset if I had someone coming in and telling me how to run a prison. And if you think about it, I've really been pushing that. I've been pushing the envelope to say nonviolent folks should not be in prison, and that does infringe on judicial discretion. I, I know that. But I guess I go back to my discussion with John Casey, and I know where I stand and what my values are. So, so I, I think that um, I would love to be able to find, and, and I, I, I do find a kinder relationship with judges. I, I quite frankly feel a pretty good relationship with most judges in Ohio. I really do. The association I'm not so sure of. The prosecutors that have a tremendous amount of control in who gets to the court and what, what, what cases are being heard and what level of felony they're being heard, uh, quite frankly, in, in all honesty, we've not had a good relationship at all with the prosecutors. So um, that's a challenge, and, and I think the sense of keeping their employment and being elected and the perception, I'm not sure this is the truth. We're going to find out with, with our constitutional amendment. There's a perception that Ohioans prefer and feel good about incarcerating people. Because you don't see people running for office saying, hey, I'm going to... I'm going to reform and I'm going to divert a lot of people. You don't hear that. But you do hear a lot on the other side, I'm going to keep your community safe by incarcerating, being sure people are incarcerated. So I think the, elect, the election issue is, is an issue. But I'm not sure that Ohioans, once given the data, once from a taxpayer standpoint and understand where their tax dollars are going, would, would necessarily agree with that. It's just very difficult getting that message out. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, I used to work under a public defender in D.C., and at one point he had made the comment that Obama was giving a speech um, one time about how the U.S. does not torture, and about five miles down the road there is uh, people in solitary confinement in the D.C. jail. And so I'm wondering uh, what solitary confinement looks like in Ohio corrections and what's being done to minimize that. That's a, that's a big issue. I happen to chair the National Committee of Directors on, we call it restrictive housing, it's solitary and confinement. And so, so a number of things have happened. We, we talked about earlier, Ohio was the first entity in the world, I think, I think three years ago, to become fully accredited through the American Correctional Association and fully 100% accredited with the Prison Rape Elimination Act. I'm proud of that. In the last year, we've led, we've rewritten standards on restrictive housing. We've talked about the mentally ill in restrictive housing and the kind of services they need. We have worked with Yale, Judith Resnick, the Lyman Project out of Yale. Uh, Judith texted me this morning at 4 o'clock, by the way, and, and worked with her. And we are measuring the number of people in solitary confinement or restrictive housing. We've met with all of our directors. We meet twice a year. We presented with Yale. Those numbers are coming significantly down. Uh, we have put in place in Ohio a, a, a fact that to put someone in, in an extended restrictive housing setting, no one from that prison can be on the panel. It has to be an external group to look at. We've talked about the mental health and medical rounds that are, that are in place, and we have seen in the last two to three years a significant drop. Now, do we still have people? Yes. And it's a tough issue. Let me just be candid. Thank you for having me here. I, I'm, no, I, this is important stuff. 
On February 21st of this year, I had a correctional officer stabbed 32 times with someone in restrictive housing, Matt Mathias. Thank God he weighed 340 pounds. It saved his life. So the question as director with 13,000 employees that are part of labor organizations, the question is the balance of protecting staff and understanding what they're going through and treating the inmates with a sense of discipline and with respect. It is a very difficult balance. Um, so our numbers have continued to go down. I believe this. I believe there will always be a need to have a restrictive housing component for someone that does those kind of things to protect staff. I believe there always will be, at least the next decade. But I think we need to be much more judicial and continue that reduction of numbers and the opportunity to transist people out. When we started this reform, this, this ought to scare everyone in this room. When we started this reform on restrictive housing, we looked 21% of the people that were leaving restrictive housing, that's someone that's in a cell 22 hours a day or more. That's a national average, or that's a national definition. 21% of those people, when we started this reform, were going directly from that cell into your communities. There was no transition. Can you imagine? So that has a principle that we, that we have uh, worked to stop as well. So, uh, and with the mentally ill that are particularly fragile in this area, that's why we want more residential treatment units with staff that are there 24 hours to be able to work with them. It's, it, is a, it, is a, it is a tough issue, but it's one that also requires leadership to balance concerns of staff. You know, I used to think a director could edict anything, right, and it would happen. Not so much. Not so much. I mean, there has to be a will of people like this at the tables to say, okay, I understand this and I'm willing to work with this. And then go out and get partners like Lutheran Metropolitan Ministries. Could you give us an idea of how much it costs to keep a person incarcerated over a period of a year and how this compares with working with that person if he were not in prison? I just heard these, I just heard these numbers uh, as we were looking at another research issue. Uh, somebody would do, do some math back there, but it's, it's approximately $72 a day, $72 a day on average to keep someone in prison. So I don't, what, what does that amount to? I, I, it used to be like $26,000, $28,000 a year. And what we have determined is that if, if you were to take that person and they were on, on a probation caseload and they go to a, 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 a drug treatment program that most are eligible under the Medicaid expansion program to participate in and bring them back in with the court cost, it's typically one-third the cost of keeping someone in prison. And as, again, for that population of nonviolent folks, it's about twice as effective keeping them in the community. So I, I don't know where all that math leads us, but th those are the numbers. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for your passionate thought and and conviction that we can um, welcome back people that have been incarcerated. I wanted to ask you more about the collateral sanctions that you were talking about because you used a number, I believe you used 800, but there are also those that are unquantifiable. I wanted to know if you could talk about how your department might be able to help people that are coming back get affordable housing so that they can use the skills and the training that they've received while they've been incarcerated or they're receiving when they return to the community but can't find someone that wants to rent to them or provide housing that they can afford. So that was a, that was a long question um, that gave me some time to think through. So. So first of all, let's, let's talk about very tangible things, right? People need jobs. We got some employers, potential employers. People need jobs. So the one thing that we have been able to finally do is pace the government, right? I don't, the pace of government's not very good. I, I mean, I'm sorry, but it, it took a while to get this done. But now every Ohioan that's incarcerated, 90 days before they leave, 
can put their resume on Ohio means jobs and we have what I call special employers and they are special to me that have special access if they are if they want to hire returning citizens that they can go into this review this and engage in an interview see here's my if you wait to get a job after you're released it's too late I've, I've never left prison again I said I probably should have but I haven't and I can't imagine on the day of release how many things are going through someone's mind and then to say okay now I gotta put get this resume and I gotta no let's get the jobs done so so Ohio means jobs and then the other piece, just like Lutheran Metropolitan Ministries and the great employers that are, we're all working with up here, or employers like, um, uh, the, I won't mention names, the, in other parts of the state where we have our, our inmates actually leaving the prison during the day, going out and working for a company that has committed to hire them, and not just hire them, but we are seeing companies are promoting people all the way through because they're seeing great candidates that are drug-free and are committed to do a good job. So, so, I, so the first thing I did want to talk about was this job thing. We, got, we can't lose sight of that. That's tangible, and that gives dignity to people, and that's important. So the second piece, we do um, quarterly reentry coalition meetings where we go around it. We do it all around Ohio. And we talk with reentry coalitions that have dedicated themselves to reaching into prisons and looking at people that are coming back to their communities. There's a neat, there's a neat program in Marion County, Marion Matters, where they go to every prison that they have a person coming back from Marion and are talking to them. They pair them up with a business person. They come out and they help them navigate this issue of housing and all of this other myriad of issues. Um, and I would just say a, a nickel's worth of information. The other thing is there's a lot of truck driver vacant uh, openings, right? You see that all over CDL. You've got a CDL. We are training CDL truck drivers with simulators and semis. We have semis, and we're taking them down to the motor ve vehicles and getting a CDL before they walk out. And then we have employers like PI&I Trucking out of Youngstown, shouldn't have said that, that are, that are hiring every single person that's coming out of prison. Those are people that are, they need employer, employees, but they also have a heart. So I think we go around to say we continue to develop best practices and we continue to reach in and try, try to provide mentoring. Let me say this. this. The answer to our rehabilitation is this. We have 50,000 inmates. We need 50,000 volunteers that are mentors. One-on-one. -on -one. Think about that. People say, I'm nuts. I probably am. But think about if someone had someone to support them that they could write to, that they could say, hey, I got an idea for a job. Think about that and think about the sense of hope that that would create and reduction of violence in our prisons. It would be a remarkable thing. And I, let's don't lose sight of that. That may happen. Uh, my interest is in severe mental illness, people with severe mental illness, and what happens to them in the prison system. And I'm wondering how much trouble the prison has with people who are so ill that they can't opt for help and they need involuntary commitment. My understanding is that problems with involuntary commitment go from the community to the prison and continue. Is that true? Yeah, we, we receive everyone that is committed to us. Now, we, we will only receive criminally sentenced Ohioans, so we don't receive civil commitments, uh, but we, that's the residential treatment units that we have, where we are able to at least provide an environment, a unit, a housing unit, where we have mental health staff there that are, that are working with folks that are ensuring that we have medication compliance. Uh, but there are people that are just severely mentally ill that are just a, a, a huge challenge in our system. And, and quite frankly, much like the nonviolent Ohioans that come to prison, our prisons are not the most suited agencies to, how, to handle that. Today at the City Club, we have been listening to just an absolutely outstanding forum 
with Gary Moore, the director of the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections. Today, the forum is sponsored by the Cleveland Browns. We're delighted to have Jimmy and Dee Haslam and a table of Browns guests and representatives with us today. Thank you for your continued support of City Club programming. Today's forum is the Karen Faith Witt and A.H. Weinstein Memorial Forum on the Persecution of Peoples, made possible by the generous grant from the Norman H. Weinstein and the Friends of Karen Faith Witt. We're delighted to have Ellen Witt Botnick, sister of Karen Witt, with us today. Thank you for your continued support of the City Club. Our community partners for today's forum are Lutheran Metropolitan Ministry and NAMI Greater Cleveland. We welcome guests at tables hosted by the Cuyahoga County Office of Reentry. We thank all of you for being here today. And that brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you, Director Moore. Thank you for everyone for joining us here today. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad. Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.